All right, we're going to go out with a bang today with, with a question that everybody on the streets is always asking themselves, well, what about jobs? And um, Eric Brynolfsson and his brave panelists are not just going to punt by talking about tomorrow. They're going to say, well, what if we actually get AGI that can do every, all our jobs cheaper and better than we can? Then how do we get income? How do we get meaning? How do we get purpose in our lives? Take it away. Thanks, Max. So let me, uh, let me just say that, you know, when I was in grad school, economics was taught to me as the study of scarcity. And Max's premise is that we'll have AGI. So I don't know, maybe, we, you know, that annoying saying, there is no free lunch. Maybe that will go away. We'll have not just free lunches, free dinners, free coffee breaks, free time at the beach. It'll be, it'll be all courtesy of AGI, not FLI. So thank you, <laughs> FLI. Um, so, so that's one kind of scenario, but as we were talking, uh, it, it's clear that's not the only kind of scenario. There, there's no economic law that says even if you create more and more abundance, that everyone's going to get a share of that. Um, it's perfectly possible you get very uneven outcomes or you get other kinds of, of different outcomes. So we'll talk a little bit about that and, and ask what, if anything, is still scarce. And as Max said, uh, most of us still get our income from jobs, and if AGI can do everything, then that may be problematic. Um, we also get um, a lot of our bargaining power, our, our, the fact that we are economically necessary gives us a lot of leverage in society, and if we are superfluous, maybe we become at the mercy of people who, who don't need us anymore, and that, that could be an issue. And, and then, of course, there's questions of uh, meaning and purpose that many of us derive from the work we do. And there are other issues that will come up as we do it. So we have this uh, uh, amazing panel here. Uh, just once again, uh, Julian Hatfield, James Manyika, and Reid Hoffman. And uh, let me just start right off by um, asking each of you. Uh, this morning, uh, Max talked about some of the destinations. So I'd like to hear each of you say something about, imagine this world that, that Max posited for us of, of a world of AGI. What, what sort of destination would you envision? Where do you see us going in that kind of world, given that there are different possibilities? Let's start with you, Jillian. Yeah. So I think what we're trying to imagine here is a world in which humans are not necessary in order to pre perform the productive work to produce all the stuff that we survive on. So the question is, what are humans doing if they're not, uh, if, if they're not engaged in jobs? Um, and I think the key thing here is to think about the fact that uh, well, first of all, humans are going to find lots of things to do, I think. We have lots of, there are lots of times in, in the history of humans when we have done things other than produce productive, uh, do productive work. Uh, and I think the key thing is that, uh, and if we're doing a vision, it's a vision of um, the ways in which we connect with one another and the communities, and preferably communities of choice that we live in. Uh, and so I think what we can imagine is that these are contexts for meaningful shared activity, that they are contexts for uh, the experience of being a valued, respected, and cared for member of a community. Uh, they can be vehicles for the distribution of resources, because even if we don't have to produce stuff, it still needs to be resources, uh, there, there needs, still needs to be distributed. Um, and settings in which we can experience uh, the, what we talked about actually with Yoshua's group yesterday, uh, the, uh, a, a fair process of collective decision making because there will still be choice and things to be decided and things to be done. So I, I, I'd like a vision of um, healthy, constructive, meaningful life through communities of choice. But, but the market sort of fades away. I, well, I think that, 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 may well be, that may well be true, and I think it's important to think of this, and I think uh, Josh Green mentioned the concept of the arc of economic history and social history, and there's been lots of times in human life where uh, we don't have anything that resembles something called a job. We may be doing okay. productive, but... Doesn't maybe. sound too bad. No, I'm, I'm positive. I, I love the existential... Reed is smiling because I know, <laughs> I know he, he can imagine other scenarios. Reed, tell us what you're thinking. So... I mean, there is one kind of happy Star Trek future universe. I don't know if I can imagine uh, human beings that aren't actually, in fact, in at least partial conflict with each other. Like if I look back on the history as I understand it, and I am also a fan of Robert Wright's Non-Zero uh, book, um, the, you know, the tension is that there's always essentially conflicts about 
you know, who's in control, uh, who has more power, who has more status, um, you know, who is, you know, more powerful within the unique, uh, and within the kind of any, almost any invented unique attributes. And so, you know, part of the benefit of the system we have today is we have a, a broad system of, of essentially kind of codependency where we have to essentially work together uh, and have it be broadly in the direction of more collaborative and more peaceful because of, of economic codependence. And if that goes away, it's a little curious as to what happens. And so, for example, uh, if you consider uh, you know, what happens if you leave a lot of uh, teenagers or young people to themselves, uh, what do they do, right? And what happens in that context? And so... And, and they've got abundance. Yeah, and presume that they have a, a sufficient yeah. abundance, so what do they do? And, you know, the answer may be a lot of vandalism or other, you know, kind of gang-related behavior or other kinds of things, which may not be our optimum Star Trek utopia. And so I tend to think that when I kind of think about sketching utopia, I tend to think, and the fractious nature of human beings, I tend to think that we want to deliberately create uh, areas by which we are involved in these cooperating and competing games together in a way that uh, we express more of what we hope for from humanity and we have less, you know, kind of free-ranging, okay, well, I'll just agitate to break the system because if the system doesn't give me a path to do that, then I will actually work to break the system. Well, that's very striking because there's a very common story that, you know, we're always fighting with each other over resources, you know, fighting over land or oil or whatever. And if only we could have, you know, no more resource constraints, those problems would go away. And you're almost saying the opposite. Yeah, I, I actually think that it's, um, it, uh, it, I, let me put it this way. I think that when you, there's a lot of theories where you say, we well, you got to increase in abundance, you get an increase in disparity. I think as far as I can tell, like a lot of people who pursue money, don't think, oh, I only get X money and I'm, go I'm done. They're looking for a lot more money. Are you done, Reed? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I would say that, I mean, I'm a kind of definition of what some people call post-economic. And I would say that uh, in terms of influence or ability to try to help the world in certain ways, no. Well, thank you for being here with us. <laughs> um, so, so, James, can you, can you reconcile these or, or go beyond them? Well, I, I think you can reconcile them, but also create a, a, a bunch of questions of how we should think about them. Because right. if you take what, what Gillian and what Reed have just said and you think about it, in the, put it in the context of economic history, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at what humans have done mm -hmm. uh, that is economic in nature, because we're having an economic discussion, it's always had th been an interplay of three specific things. Uh, one is something around scarcity talked about that, either who has access to them, who owns them, who controls them, etc. Scarcities have played a big part of our human activity. The other one is just when humans then organize and put together factory inputs to produce something, mm -hmm. uh, factors of production, whether it's capital or labor, to produce some output, uh, whether it's to feed themselves, and, and that gets to the third thing, which is there's always demand for those outputs. Now, those demands are either to feed themselves, consume themselves, or have somebody who can pay for them or somebody to exchange them with. Mm -hmm. So you have to have all three elements. That's how we've organized society for the most part. And when you look at communities, even pre-industrial, that's what they did. Uh, that's what they did. And so the benefit, so with AGI, we change all three elements. Mm -hmm. If we get to we and sort of, the first one is kind of the root of the other two, I think, isn't it's it? It's the root of the other two, but the other two are also important because They've played a role like the second one, organizing the factors of production. That's what human beings have ended up doing. When people mm -hmm. go to work or when mm -hmm. they go farming or they grow vegetables, mm -hmm. they're doing the second thing. Mm -hmm. uh, to produce something. To produce something. Either they'll eat themselves or consume or whatever have you. Mm -hmm. So AGI changes all three things. But I think before we get to the scenarios, I think it's also important to recognize that uh, how beneficial all of this has been. Right? If you think about how communities, to Julian's point, have emerged, other than kinship communities, mm -hmm. all the other communities have been in pursuit of some version of these three things. Either they're organizing to grow something or to go hunting together or to create something and then exchange it with somebody. And that's, created the, that's been the basis of survival, but also prosperity, but also the rewards uh, and ultimately the power that societies have had. So when you take all of that away, mm -hmm. then you're left with, okay, hopefully a world of abundance, mm -hmm. 
then you now have these distributional questions mm -hmm. that you now have to deal with. One, one, one analogy that might be useful to think about is think about, um, I guess, the, the only examples we've had of abundance, uh, unlimited abundance, have been rich people, you know, aristocrats or whatever in history. What have mm -hmm. they ended up doing, right? Mm -hmm. They've ended up either, in a good sense, becoming, you know, gentlemen, and there were men, gentlemen scientists, amateur scientists. Or right, you think it's through the Renaissance or, yeah. Exactly, or they've gone exploring, mm -hmm. right? Or they've pursued power and control for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and, right? So that's what they end up doing. Now, again, at least a couple of those are related to economic activity, mm -hmm. but the worrying thing is that you may end up where Reed was, which is all you're left with, if, if AJS solves all these other things, all mm -hmm. the economic parts of that, mm -hmm. then you're left with competition or other behaviors that are not necessarily productive. So the question is, what does, that, does that lead us to a good outcome or not? It's one of the questions. And then also the question is, what scarcities do, what are, the, what are, what are gonna be the real scarcities in a, a yeah, world. I want to come to that real scarcity one, but I want to give Jillian a chance to respond a little bit because it's a little surprising, I think, to a lot of people that, that James and Reed don't see a world of abundance of one as less conflict. And you described a kind of a really nice world where we're cooperating more in groups. But, but how do you respond to these other uh, uh, concerns? Well, I think, so I was, I, I was laying out what's a, what's a I think, a, a, a potentially attainable hopeful vision of the world, but I do think the future has a ton of politics in it, mm -hmm. um, because I think that... More or less? Uh, probably more, actually. If you've got more time, yeah. I think humans will, I think we will cooperate to find meaning, to construct meaning, but we will also continue to construct, I'm more important than you, I am entitled to more than you. We still haven't figured out how to distribute the benefits right. of the Industrial Revolution to almost three quarters of the planet. So I think that the, yeah. the okay. I, although I, so I don't actually think that we are facing a world of, you know, we'll have lots of stuff, everybody will get along, we'll be nice to everybody. I don't think that's the case. I think the real challenge is can we come up with the mechanisms and the structures in which uh, we invent better ways to accomplish this or that, that. But I do think there, again, Josh Green mentioned this, sort of that the continual progress in terms of figuring out how to cooperate over broader groups. And yeah. I think having communities' choice is an important part of that. But I think the question for us, and I totally agree with that, Julian, the question is, if you take you know, Josh's history, and that's economic history, which is the basis of that cooperation, for the most part, has been economic in some form or fashion. We're exchanging things, we're working together to create something. When those, are, when those communities and of cooperation have been be anything other than kinship communities, they've been largely economic. So in a world in which the economic motivations are not, or at least imperatives yeah. aren't there anymore, what's the basis for the community? That's what I think we would have there, to there's this, uh, there's this famous quote from Adam Smith that I, I love. It, it, he says, I may get this a little wrong maybe, but he says, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the baker, or the brewer that we get our meat, bread, or, or beer. It's because they're looking out for their own self-interest. So that leads them to, to cooperate. Maybe if you take away that, that benefit from cooperation, could, could things be worse? Well, I, get, I think I want to challenge the idea that the only reason people come together okay. to cooperate in groups okay. is to produce economic value. Yeah. I do think that has been an incredibly important driver, and it's mm -hmm. an incredibly important driver. I think Reid mm -hmm. is right about that for figuring out how to, not to fight so much, right? Because we can be more productive. Mm -hmm. But we come together in uh, research societies, we come together yep. in religions, we form bands, we dance together, we go out to the desert, and <laughs> um, I mean, we do a lot of other things <laughs> uh, together. And I think that if we don't have to be at work, I, look, I don't ever plan on retiring because I don't even understand what that means. Right. I, and it's I am not doing because what you I need the money necessarily. Exactly. I, yeah. As long as right. I, you know, that would be the sad part if I had to. Mm -hmm. uh, not right. do what I do yeah. now because I had to do something else to earn income. Yeah. So I. Oh, let, let me just come back to the, this question. I promised to come back to about, about scarcity because I mean there are those. Um, I'm, so I'll quote John Maynard Keynes here. He said that he thought that the economic problem, if we look into the future, is not the permanent problem of the human race. He wrote that in 1930. He predicted that by 2030 that we would be have so much abundance that that the economic problem would largely go away. I don't know if the timing is going to be quite right, but he defined the economic problem pretty narrowly to be um, that most of the world, um, I won't read the whole quote, but it was, was in a struggle for subsistence. 
and that you could imagine a world where we have more than enough food, uh, clothing, shelter, etc. So suppose we, we posit such a world, um, which I, I mean, if you look at the Millennium Development Goals, we actually are blowing past some of the goals that were set in 1990 in terms of extreme poverty reduction. And some people predict that, that extreme poverty, which is a low bar, admittedly, will be eliminated by 2030 or 2035. But even if we assume such a world, um, let me ask each of you, what, if anything, would be scarce in such a world? So I think one of the predictions of what will be scarce is I think compute is going to be scarce because I think that infant demand, the J curve, is going to go up for it. I think that's part of the thing that's happening within whatever, wherever you are on the scope of AGI and, and whatever years, I think that's going up. Um, I don't know about um, matter energy conversion stuff, but I do think actually, in fact, energy will also then get scarce because like, like uh, compute, there will be a demand for energy. I mean, more or less what we've seen in our history is uh, whatever economic energy you can create, the demand simply goes up to meet the energy. So I think the J curve on that's going to go up. So I think there's going to be that. And then most importantly, when you get to human beings, I think there's a bunch of relative goods, status, control, power, other kinds of things that will also be important. Now, I would also just note... That, Wait, say, what, say let me say, relevant, relevant, well, relevant. Say, let me say one more thing, and then I, you can come back if I haven't answered it. Um, I wasn't meaning to, to be purely pessimistic in my alternative vector answer to how uh, Jillian opened, which is I do think it's possible to shape things that are a combination of competition and cooperation that have utopic aspects. Whether that's the highest utopia or not, I think is an interesting discussion. But like, for example, if you say, well, say we don't need to, to compete and cooperate for economics anymore, say food security, housing security, clothing security, it's all... 100% distributed, we haven't, as you've mentioned, even solved those distribution problems yet, let alone the future. But you could still say, okay, well, who are, who are the best entertainers? Who are the best philosophers? Who are the best theorists? Who are the best, like a whole set of different kinds of things may still create a competition and compete co uh, landscape that if we can get enough of humanity bought into, you might create a stable system that has utopic aspects, even though the are we competing because we can't afford shelter or we can't afford food? Maybe possible. Yeah, so just to be real, real sharp, to make sure I, I'm getting that. So there are some goods like food, clothing that you just, yeah. some absolute amount and you're more or less sat satisfied. And then there are other goods that are relative and it's sort of a, a, an ordinal ranking. And yep. you know, by definition, there can only be number one number one person, and so that's always going to be scarce. Yes, and so you can still create a system around that that hopefully, if you can get enough people to buy in, can have a much more peaceful characteristic. I was going to jump in, which is maybe one of the things that's important in this conversation is to think about even what the conception of AGI actually is. Because if, we, if it's truly as expansive as we think it is in its capabilities, Many of the things, I guess, that we've come together as people to do, beyond even the economic, it will do. Create art, create music, create entertainment, create empathy mechanisms. So if we truly take it to the extreme, mm -hmm. where it's actually doing all of those, many of the things that then get left over, so to speak, are not all good, or at least have unpredictable ends. So you could argue religion, you could argue kinship, tribal instincts of one sort or another. Uh, so that's what I worry about. Uh, now, if our conception of AGI is different, meaning, okay, so maybe it's, you know, I'll, I'll use one example. I'll take Stuart Russell's right in front of me. Who takes Stuart's view of these three principles? That necessarily has a role for people because, in fact, part of what we do in that system, in your view, if we realize AGI the way you propose, People are playing the role of creating a mechanism to reflect our preferences through other things. So we necessarily have a role. But if the AGI is totally in control, mm -hmm. totally, and creates all the outputs, then I think it's different. So I think it's hard to have this conversation without also having some view of would, would you think what the expansive nature of the AGI actually people looks People might like. um, prefer um, artisanal products that were certified, human created, even if they're quality was indistinguishable or worse than the ones that were created by machines? Could you yeah. imagine a market for that? Yeah, it's, it's quite possible. So, so for example, so you are, maybe we're getting to the question of so what jobs are there yeah. in this, in, or activities mm -hmm. are there? Mm -hmm. 
So it's obviously the view that says, well, maybe there'll be things we will necessarily prefer them because of the human role in creating them. And we prefer that for its own sake. Mm -hmm. Not that it's necessarily a better product or is an outcome, but just yeah. the fact that humans created it, we come to value it. Mm -hmm. We could decide raising our children, even though you know, there may be a safer system managed by the agent that could do that. We actually mm -hmm. prefer a human role in that. So we could mm -hmm. define things that we value because of the inherent mm -hmm. the role that humans have played in them. That could be one way of thinking about Well, that's about interesting. I think that's an interesting line. So you mentioned right? a couple of things. Well, let's, let's pursue that. In this world of, of AGI and perhaps material abundance, are there, we heard, we heard about some scarce things, are there some things, do you, do you imagine that jobs will still exist or that, that there's some other way of distributing income? Actually, let's hear from the other two panelists. Are, are there still, will there still be so I, anything like I, work or jobs? So I, I think thinking about things in terms of the consumption value of products and jobs is you know, thinking about our economic system as it is today. And I think, so I don't even think we have to think about, will people prefer human-made art, music, and so on? Oh, I say, no, but people will want to relate to other humans in that way. They will want to produce those things. There are conversations and things that we create and interactions and relationships and games we play and so on that I think will continue to be activities that we don't need to think of them as producing consumption goods. Um, so people will do them like people, like gifts or just, you know, interacting with each other. I will still whether, want to no, no money involved. I will still want to sit around with people and talk about things like this, mm -hmm. um, not as a product, but as an activity. Right. Um, so uh, may, thinking about it as jobs and the production of consumption goods may be, may be too narrow. Mm -hmm. In terms of how, um, uh, res resources and income get distributed. So if I think about the danger of, and we think about sort of the very current, the current concept, but the, this danger with the, we're already seeing it, the uh, reduction in jobs and therefore high levels, higher levels of unemployment. And what do we see with that? We see the real danger there is the disconnection, the disaffectation, the not, not actually being yeah. a part of a group. Uh, so I think part of the group notion is actually we need those groups in order to be part of how we connect with the rest of the world, and that may be the mechanism to use I, for I, distributing. I want to follow up on that, but first, but that's a different topic. I just want to see if, if Reid has anything he wants to add on the, will there still be jobs or work that people do or something that looks like that? So, I mean, I, entertainingly, I uh, wrote my thesis at Oxford on the limits of thought experiments and reasoning. <laughs> and so when you engage in, in these kinds of uh, very speculative thought experiments. I always get worried, uh, especially when I'm doing it. The, um, uh, I guess what I'd say is I don't know how to imagine a broadly more peaceful society that doesn't involve some areas where people are competing in various ways for a sense of purpose or a sense of of significance and that where that sense of purpose comes with a reward structure. It doesn't necessarily have to come with a reward structure in terms of physical goods, but right. it may come in terms of relative goods. It or could be kind of citations. Yes, exactly, <laughs> as, a, as an example. And so, and we already live in a world where we have a blend of things where people do activities just because they'll do them anyway, because they think I'm fascinated by this, I love this, I want to create this, mm -hmm. I love hanging with these kinds of people, that sort of thing, and a bunch of I'm doing this because it it gets me my relative position, mm -hmm. et cetera. And we hope, in, as we make progress in society, that we move away from you know, fear of death, fear of starvation, fear of house homelessness, fear of you know, threat of violence, and so forth. And we mm -hmm. evolve as a society, and we get uh, absolutely as many people out of that as possible. But I still think we, that we'll find some other, it could be citations, it could be yeah. Twitter followers. Yeah. It could be, you know, friends in your circle. I mean, these are some of the other possible ones. So this kind of, of fractionist, fractious competitiveness, I don't know how to imagine human beings as we are today without that. And so I think you need to build that into your system. Well, so now I'll come back to, to Jillian and, and maybe James too about is that a solution? Is that how we get meaning? If, if people lose their jobs as, as truckers and coal miners and whatever, uh, and many of them seem, you know, the deaths from despair are taking off, as, as uh, Case and Deaton described. In part, people think because a lot of people have lost their, their economic meaning and purpose and feel despair. But, but in Reed's 
scenario, there's plenty of other ways to get meaning. We could, can, we, can we repurpose our, uh, our goals? Well, I, I, as I say, I think, I, I think we will find those ways. And the key thing is, can we provide the social and normative structure for people that mm -hmm. makes those healthy groups and not um, dysfunctional groups that protects people against isolation? And I think, I, going back to the scarcity question, it's either a scarcity or a constraint. Um, I do agree that you leave a bunch of humans around for very long and they're going to start to say, okay, you don't get anything. <laughs> and I actually care a lot about what you do. It actually has no direct impact on me, but I don't want you doing that thing, right? Or you've got the wrong color skin or you believe the wrong things and I'm actually going to interfere with the way you're living your life. I think that continues to be a major risk. So I think a scarcity we face is our capacity for managing that. And we've made a lot of progress on that, but we still... Um, are, are limited, and I, I'd like to think we talked about this as well. You know, you know whether whether AI can help us doing that, but it's, it's a real challenge. Because yeah. well, yeah, go ahead. Jim. No, so, 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 so maybe to build on that, Julian. Maybe one of the ways to think about that is to think about could we specify a reward system or some kind of conditioned UBI that amplifies, you know, I'd, I'd argue, the the proxy that came from the economic system, right? Because one of the things that the economy, economic system does, it created mechanisms for self-improvement uh, in a way that encouraged that. It, mechanisms for discovery, for re motivating research, mechanisms that created codependence necessarily within groups, but also between groups. Because without that, I worried that the communities that could emerge could be based on more trivial and potentially worrisome things that are mostly kinship related or tribal. But so could we artificially build into the system mechanisms for community that look like maybe proxies for the economic Well, well let me put like, you on right? the spot. Can, well, can let you me flesh add that one out? thing yeah, go ahead. and, yeah, and go then ahead. maybe flesh that out. But like one of the arcs when I think about the conversation today, and this does apply to the jobs question too, is you say, well, should humanity be in control? And there are human beings that I can think of and I go, oh good, that'd be good. I can think of human beings that go, oh, God, that'd be terrible. <laughs> it depends on which humans. Yeah. <laughs> right? So what does humanity and control mean is one of these questions. And that does apply to, well, what's the system overall um, in terms of how are we living together, how are we, right. whether it's an individual focus at, or, yeah. quote, unquote, more Eastern focus or more society focus or more path-dependent focus, like how do we get to that, um, you know, kind of quality lot? Well, uh, and that raises a question of, of power, who, who gets mm -hmm. to make these decisions. I want to get some questions from the audience in, too, but, but let me go back to James. Now that you have uh, 30 seconds to think about a little bit more what this conditional, well, I guess that's an oxymoron, conditional, unconditional basic income. The conditional basic income, I mean, how would it, uh, how would it look? And, and one of the beauties of the market system, at least to economists like me, is that it's relatively decentralized and self-organizing. Could it be done in that way, or do you need to have some uh, government or central authority set up the rules? Well, I think you'd want to be self-organizing in some fashion, but I think part of it is, you know, the, that's the work I think somebody has to do, right? Which is, I'd want it to encourage some individual behaviors that are mostly constructive. Mm -hmm. uh, self-learning, self-improvement, discovery, all those things. I'd also want it to encourage these group behaviors mm -hmm. that are productive, cooperation, codependence, interdependence, et cetera. Then I think we have a healthy outcome. Uh, now, how we administer that or create the mechanisms for that, I think that's probably the, the the new economics to be invented and mm -hmm. thought about how do those marketplaces work. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be some lessons to be learned from what we're starting to see with rating systems and other things to learn from, and build feedback on system. feedback yeah. systems of mm -hmm. some sort and yeah. so forth. But I maybe, think that's what we have to construct. Andrew Wang, I've heard him propose, um, you know, maybe this is a, perhaps too simple, but straw proposal is that uh, a basic income, but conditional on people learning particular skills, and so that it kind of encourages them to constantly be upskilling and, and learning new things. Yeah, there's another answer, by the way, of course, which takes us back to what the AGI looks like. So there's the, I describe what I call the steward's version. There's another version where they're totally in charge, but they decide, the AGI or AGIs decide that they, they want to keep us around for whatever reason. I could imagine they could create rake work for us. Is that a good keep, scenario? To, well, but, but, but it is just a, a clever way to create a mechanism okay. to keep us doing Make us feel like less we're important. destructive things. Maybe that's what they're doing right now. We might. It's quite possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't tell us, right? Um, so, will, so, 
Uh, can, I, can I add one thing? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I want to say about the, the idea of the, how do you encourage good behavior, right? How do we encourage mm -hmm. good, fair, cooperative behavior? And I think the way humans have always done that is to create groups that generate value and uh, that can create their own rules about how we behave, and you get kicked out of the group if you, uh, if you don't. And, and groups keep forming those. And so I, I, you know, I think posit, we think of universal basic income as something that goes to individuals mm -hmm. because it's replicating the idea of the individual yeah. in a market, but maybe we should be thinking about uh, resources that are going to groups. Think of a group and then let the group And then the group it. is making the decision and, and I say if these are groups that people can join and- Are, are you worried that, that we already have a lot of tribalism in our society and this would even just give more and more incentive for people to form these, these groups of us versus them? I think it's a messy process. Of, we have, here we have tribalism. We also have families and mm -hmm. academic societies and workplaces and young people who don't hang out and want to engage in uh, vandalism, we'll, we'll, but who we'll, want to save the world. I think we call them gangs. But we also have young people who are saying, I want to make the world a better place, yeah. and I want to find other people like me who want to make the world a better place. And you see the net. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, but you're, you're emphasizing, I think, the net benefits of these groups as opposed to some of the, I, the downsides. I think we're on a process of figuring out how do we get more of that kind of group behavior mm -hmm. and less okay. of the other. And that's the great challenge. So just, before, just a small note on okay. that. But I think this way I, we should go back to Josh's point in the sense that, so what's the analog of trade in this world? Right? Because if these groups are self-contained, and I also worry about that, but when they're trading and exchanging something, and they're codependent for whatever reason, that's better all around. So what's the analog of trade in a human API world? I guess it's the question I posed to you. There's your answer. We said there's no money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That, well, that's a good question. It it like, we'll have to ask the AGI to help us with that. They're competing, they're, they're competing I mean, look, for membership. This gets back to the thought experiment stuff, but a lot of the, cult, the creation of culture and interaction tends to be where you think from today's point of view. But one of the problems with thought experiments is you tend to think your, imagine is much, your imagination is much more free roaming than it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's many things that you can't right. imagine as they get there, which well, is part of the reason making analogies here, here yes. because that's yes. the best we can do is yeah. something right. that exists. But let me come back to a point you made a little while ago uh, about, about power and the AGI right. deciding. Because one of the concerns I have is that whether it's a, a UBI or a conditional basic income or whatever, that, that through all of history, we humans have been essential. We've had an economic role, and the feudal lord or the capitalist owner, or whatever, couldn't do their stuff without us. And therefore, that gave us a certain amount of bargaining power. Um, they couldn't just ignore us all or, or kill us all. But if if there's an AGI that can produce everything, it, and it's you know it's by its benevolence, or maybe it's an AGI run by a, a small group of humans, um, they give us the AGI. They give us the basic income, but it's really just because they feel like it. If, if they didn't want to, they wouldn't have to, and we couldn't do anything about it. Is that, that seems like a, an unstable or worrisome scenario. Does that worry you guys? It worries me. It worries me a lot. That's why I go back to unless you build it the way Stuart wants to build it, because there's an inbuilt role for humans in that, in that model. Well, we declare there is, but if, if somebody, if the people who are running the AGI decide that these other humans aren't, needed anymore, there's nothing really stopping them from doing that, right? Uh, not, not in the way that there was historically. No, but, but, but you know, for sure, he should speak for himself, but at least the way I understand what you're proposing is that there's a necessarily societal human role in shaping the values that we care about. We kind of hard code Which that. then get reflected, but they're constantly evolving. They're not stationary, so we can't hard code. They're, so there's a constant interplay, as I understand it, between what we humans want and so forth, and what the AGI is doing, so that there's a necessarily inbuilt role for us in that system. Okay, it's declared that we have that power. Okay. But Any I, anybody else want to comment on that, and then we'll, then yeah, we'll get so some questions. I, I mean, I think a lot of the conference and the workshop have been about the big, big questions about you know, is it going to be an agent? Is it going to be multiple agents? What's the role for humans? Does it have power over us? And I think the, one of the questions we're trying to answer is that. Even if it's not, what does it look like? And, and so I, I sort of imagine, okay, think of it, it's sort of, Eric's talked about it like this, you know, it, it's a technology and it's available uh, to all so that we can, we can produce as much as we want of the stuff service. that we want, the services, services model. model. 
Uh, and then you say, okay, so the real question then is, do humans still have meaningful lives? Uh, I think they will still try to uh, uh, gain power over each other, and we have to be figuring out how to, how to manage that. Um, and I think that's what humans have had to do since the beginning. So by my clock, we still have a little bit of time. Let's uh, get some actually, questions in. Two seconds, but okay, one ahead. of the yeah. earlier panelists made a point that I think is super important, which is we tend to think that we are at the current pinnacle of enlightenment, you know, because it was a little bit like, do you mean society by, I think it was like middle age, you know, middle, uh, medieval, um, you know, European or other folks and so forth. And I actually think one of the most mind-bending part of this is to try to figure out how, if you're presuming that there's a, dy there's a dynamic of progress, how you're allowing that discovery process to happen in the best possible way versus the setting it now mm -hmm. is, I think, one of the criteria of design yeah. for what you're looking for. Yeah, and make, yeah, right. Okay, Joshua. So I want to come back to uh, something uh, that was mentioned about research requiring an economic incentive. I actually disagree with that. Uh, and a good example is academia, uh, which produces a lot of uh, knowledge and new ideas. And of course, we have salaries and so on, but it's kind of like universal basic income for professors and, and a very <laughs> lower one right. For, right. For, for students. But, but it's kind of a constant thing, which doesn't you know, have much of a strong relationship with our output. And instead, if you ask people you know, why they're doing it and why, for example, um, you know, am I staying in academia and not going to industry and many other professors in computer science, it, it, we're not completely, uh, once we have enough money, we're motivated by other things, uh, like the, the pleasure of producing new ideas and, and being part of a community. I mean, like the communities of, uh, created by researchers are super important to our own worth and, and meaning, and it's not necessarily coming from the economic incentive. Let, let, me, let me ask you, Joshua. I mean, I mean. So one version is that you know citations and other scarce things is the motivation. Another version is that's, that it's, the it's just one. the it's just the love of knowledge, and we wouldn't need any of the extrinsic motivation. We would just do it. And maybe maybe a, a third version is is well, it's related. It's sort of is, is altruism. Would you put? Wait on one or the other of those as, as the main driver of... So of I think it depends of, on the social context. So if, if you're in a community which is valuing uh, citations, then suddenly it becomes important for you because you, you want to get uh, to be rewarded by the community. But if you're in a group, I've seen groups uh, working together mm -hmm. where it wasn't something uh, in their mind, but uh, rather the, the pleasure of, of you know, creating and doing things together and, and so on. And so it really depends how we want to set it up. Yeah, if, if I could just make one quick comment, Joshua. I wasn't suggesting that there are necessarily economic incentives for everything. I'm just saying that there are activities that are largely economic in the sense that the, what's being created, whether it's knowledge, has value. Now, whether it's get monetized in dollars and cents is a separate question, but there's some economic value and sense of contribution okay, so, to so, the advancement of society. So, but, but the, the one thing with the economic aspect is that uh, we're focusing on the value in dollars, right? And it's something we can quantify yeah, I, and, and in that's market. that's what I was doing. But a lot mm -hmm. of the value, for example, that we produce yeah. in academia isn't something that we can quantify so easily. And for example, we, the amount of uh, resources we're getting from grants doesn't depend on our citation no, index. I, I think we agree. I, I, let me defend okay. James so a little bit here. I think that, that, that at least the way I was interpreting it is that there's a broader definition uh, right. than just the dollar. So we were assuming away almost immediately the dollar motivation right. Are there other things that are sort of somewhat scarce that would continue to motivate us? Right. Um, yeah. So, so for example, if I look at uh, how we are evaluating research, mm -hmm. uh, especially maybe in the humanities, but also in, in science in general, it all it has a lot to do with uh, what is perceived by other humans uh, mm -hmm. that it brings to society in terms of the the, the common good or the value yeah. to society which is very hard to quantify. And we do it all the time, and it kind of works right. reasonably well. But it well. could be accolades or, you know, yeah. you know sense of the yeah. community. And yeah, so there are these other things. And, and I think there's an agenda to understand better those other non-monetary motivations. I mean, economists love the monetary ones because you just like, you can put numbers and you can do math with them. And the other stuff is a lot harder to, to formalize. Yeah. Can I just ask you a quick question, Joshua? Because I'm intrigued by this, not to prolong this. So one is the wider deficit of economic of value that we're talking about. Also, the concept of the AGI we're talking about, if it's truly the AGI we, in its full sense, is probably creating much of the knowledge too. Mm. 
Right. Right. But if it's if it's that kind of AGI, so that's why I think some level true, but we have, we have to ground. So the question, therefore, point. if we're doing knowledge creation work, what form of that is that knowledge creation so work? I think, and how I do think you there's, there's so let, me, let, me, let me just say there's a bunch of hands yeah. here, and I think we should. This is a really interesting conversation. We should have it, but let's get some other. There's a how about in the back corner? Uh, right there, right, right, right there, with the, next to the mic. Yep. So. Um, it occurs to me that there's a population. But keep that, your answers really. Yeah. I mean, questions really short, and we'll have to. We can try and get as many in as we can. Go ahead. There's, there oh, is sorry. a population that you could look to. Uh, you're talking about in loco parentis, right? So look at children. Mm -hmm. So that's our model. Okay. Um, who yeah. wants? How, here's, there's, there's a mic over <clears> there. Yeah. Uh, when we project ourselves into a uh, AGI induced scarcity, I kind of worry when we trying to reproduce what we did with what Francis Fukuyama did with liberal democracy, projecting a kind of end of history. Mm -hmm. um, part of what I heard, only part of what I heard, because of the thought experiment, uh, re refers to that. I think it's um, because it's a thought experiment, we have to project ourselves. But intuitively, uh, it's going to remain messy, even with an abundance, that's for sure. And it's not going to be the end of history. And if we project ourselves right. that way, we will, t history will strike back a bit like uh, we're seeing it right now. There is no free lunch. Um, and what John Maynard Keynes projected in the 30s vis a vis what, what would happen 100 years later is, did not consider, for example, CO2 emission and the fact that global warming is really endangering the very model of society that he had in mind. So, in, in a way, projecting ourselves in, into an AGI or post AGI world is more. A practice than an ideology, which is not easy to do. I know. Yeah, and and, and, that, and you know that's a expansion on on something we touched on too briefly, which is even if we have uh, abundance on some dimensions, there may be scarcity on environmental status, uh, compute, and other other dimensions that we need to worry about. Right here. And I just love the, the trade uh, question by James. Uh, and uh, wouldn't you consider trade in general as like? put in some energy to reduce your entropy and then put in some energy to reduce my entropy. Overall, the entropy increases. But uh, shouldn't we strive for making humans some some form like of ox peaks and cow cowbirds for AGI to remain in business with them? <laughs> no, I, I like those ideas a lot because I think, I think I don't have an answer to you, but, but I think I'm, I'm just trying to think about some way to construct societal codependence in the system so we don't devolve into unproductive behavior. But that's a good suggestion. I like that too. Okay, I think we can maybe get two more questions. So right here. Uh, I just wanted to uh, note that I think it's interesting that in these discussions, definitely not just this one, I think we often bring up the okay. idea of creating art or creating music, things like this. Um, and we often, oh, I've, I don't think I've ever heard sports mentioned, like team sports, competitive sports. Yeah. Um, and maybe it's because we're like intelligentsia and it's not classy to care about sports. Um, yeah. But I'm interested if, if you, what you think about um, that is a, as an answer to things like the need for competition, need for community, need for meaning. Um, it seems like a lot of people have turned to sports as a way of expressing some of the more maybe violent or competitive um, sure. intuitions that we Poker. have. Poker. Poker. Everyone agreeing, I guess? Yes. No, yes. I, I, yes. I love that because yes. that's a, to me that's a part of deciding that some things are inherently human can only be done a certain way, so oh. we're going to keep doing those things. Okay, can we get over? How about Stuart? Um, so I, I, I sense a conclusion that, that interpersonal services are going to be a big part of the future. Um, but I would argue that it's still going to be an economy because that in many cases there's an asymmetry. So somebody might like to talk to Jillian, but Jillian might not like to talk to that person quite so much. <laughs> but she's willing to do it in return for something that that other per that person can provide something else, like you know a violin lesson, right? So then we get to barter, and then of course as soon as you've got three people, you can't do barter, then you do money, right? And and we're back to the same old system, except that the things that uh, we mm -hmm. want from each other are these interpersonal services that we don't want from a machine. I don't want to have lunch with a machine. Mm -hmm. um, now and then when you think about that, you think, well, how good are we at doing that? We're very good at producing cell phones and microphones and screens and cars, but we're totally hopeless at producing high quality, high value interpersonal services. We don't know how to do it. We don't have a science of it. We don't have an engineering of it. We don't teach people and credentialize and professionalize them to do it. 
And many of those professions are low status, low income right now as a result. Um, so if people are going to have a meaningful economic role with a meaningful, useful distribution of income, uh, then we're going to have to totally change our educational system, our science base, and the way our economy is structured around these kinds of things. Most people are going to be self-employed uh, in this future, for example. So things are going to be very, very different from what they are now. Sounding like a feminist. <laughs> um, no, but, but, right, so yes, there are things that we value, uh, interpersonal uh, relations. I'm not sure that thinking about it as services is the only way, but I agree with you. There will be those kinds of, those kinds of economies. What about this point that, that, that you require money? And that, I think that would, you, you seem to agree a lot, or I hear echoes yeah. of what, a lot of what you said, except I think you didn't see a role for money, and maybe he does. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I can, okay. yes, I, the, the way it's framed, I can see, yes, there could still be, and th this is related to the way that James was also expressing it. There are things that humans want that other humans right. provide that are not provided, or we don't want them provided by machines, and that's, that's an economy. Um, okay. But I'm also, and that, but that's also the point about a, a community and a structure, a social structure that supports that. So uh, we've been granted an extra couple minutes, so I think we can get two more really quick questions, and then we're going to have to wrap up with some uh, recommendations. Yeah, so, hey, so um, a lot of this discussion. Nope. See, nope. Let, let's go here first, and then in the back. Sure. A lot of this discussion seems to be implicitly premised on an assumption about human nature, somehow that uh, is is fixing certain levels on values and mindsets that are culturally learned. I mean, there have been a couple of comments to the contrary, but I think there's still a very strong assumption there. Yeah, certainly there's always going to be some competition and some cooperation, but um, are, we, are we selling ourselves too short there? Should we have like more emphasis, be more open to evolving val values and mindsets and, and the role of AIs in that? There's a, I forget who, there's a quote from the, um, the East that says that while the West was learning to control matter, the East was learning to control mind. Um, and, the, you know, we're talking a lot about goal alignment. What about, you know, thinking about this more in terms of values alignment and values evolution? Anyone want to respond to that? I mean, I, uh, I'd be delighted the more that's the case. I just have tended to see most of the people who uh, most vociferously in a political arena argue a it's all higher-minded values tend to be more realpolitik and truth. Great. Last question. Thanks. Um, so Stuart said he doesn't want to have lunch with a robot, and I intuitively in my gut feel somewhat similarly, or I, I get his point. But I think it's um, incorrect to assume that other people will share that preference, especially if we're talking about AGI, which is superior to humans at doing anything that humans can do. AIs might be more engaging conversation partners, they might give better violin lessons, so on and so forth. So I think, um, especially if we think about going really a lot further into the future and beyond current generations and people who are alive and maybe already have some sentimental attachment to interacting with other humans, I think it's actually not clear that that's going to remain valued. And uh, I think that's something that's worth thinking about. Um, and it might even be oppressive in some sense to uh, try and enforce people to value other humans' company if they find that they really prefer the company of AIs. Do you guys agree? Yes. You do? <laughs> well, I, I think you're not talking about forcing anybody <laughs> to decide that they have to uh, prefer lunch with a human to, to a machine. I, I don't think we're talking about that. Um, I, I, and, and I am also thinking about, like, I think we don't only want to be thinking of it in terms of producing stuff uh, or services, it's the act, the expression, the, the engagement. Um, you know, I like having conversations with people I have lives and connections with. It's not just I want to have a good conversation so any machine Does, does it matter to you if you know that it's a real person versus a simulation that's better and more interesting and more engaging? Um, I don't know, but I don't have, I, I mean, I have history. This is, you know, I have history and relationships with people over time. Mm -hmm. And so I see them again, and I want to have a conversation. I have an ongoing life with them. It's not just about the consumption activity of a conversation. I have no idea how much I will enjoy having a conversation with an AI, but I'm totally open to what might come. I'll offer an analogy. Um, if you look at it, 
for example, you look at a bunch of three-year-olds, five-year-olds, they do like to interact with adults, but they also like to interact with each other a lot, right? So if you say, well, we get to super intelligence and it's really so much better than us and all these mm -hmm. things, I suspect that there will still be a role where we'd like to interact with each other, somewhat similar to like the five-year-old, at minimum. All right, on that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and the, 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 only, the only last thought is that I think whatever the sphere of yep. these preferred human, necessarily human activities are, mm -hmm. I just hope that they're big enough to occupy mm -hmm. all of us. Yeah, yeah. There's they may enough or may not. of them I, mean, I, I do know that there are people, I found out the other day, will pay $100,000 for a Hermes bag that's handmade. Um, that specifically has a lot of human labor into it, and they would not pay that if it were machine made. Now, I don't, not my preferences, but there are at least some people who How have- How many? How many of these they sell? I don't know. How many of those people? <laughs> oh, how many of those people? No, I, yeah, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's enough to employ everybody, but there are at least some people who have a very strong <laughs> preference for you know genuine art as opposed to reproductions, you know, handmade this um, personal that as opposed to things that maybe uh, intrinsically are better or indistinguishable. So that you know. I don't know how, where that value comes from. It's something we need to study more. But let me, uh, let me wrap up by giving you each a chance to make a recommendation or advice uh, that you, it has to be brief, but do you have any uh, thoughts about how we get to the, to the good scenarios that we've heard on the, on the panel and avoid the bad scenarios? Um, we can go, let's go, well, let's go in the same order, I suppose. Okay, so I'm gonna pick up on the Hermes bag and the governance question and the point that we don't know it anywhere near enough about how human normative go governance structures work. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's probably a signaling system, the expensive bag, by the way, it's totally constructed. It may have something to do with status. <laughs> and, but we don't, we don't have very, we have pretty naive ideas about how those systems work. Mm -hmm. And I think we need, if, if we're going to figure out how to develop the, the, the institutions, the organizations, the structure that navigate that complex process of, of how, what do we do in a, a very, very different world, I think we need to be studying. Uh, uh, I think we need to be uh, every year, decade, et cetera, making sure that we're having each other be uh, evolve, involved with each other, right? Whether it's codependency or anything else, and whether it's jobs or anything else. So maybe we're going to be inventing, you know, thousands of new sports. Um, but you know, the, I think that's an important thing to pay attention to and make sure is part of it. Um, codependence. And coevolution with you know between us and the machines, mm -hmm. uh, and between us and different communities of us, where there's interdependence, and we actually need each other as people, but as people and machines. And then second, we, we, there's no you way to, your recommendations. We should look for ways to encourage we should design that. it. We should design, design okay. our systems that way. Design the AGIs that way. Mm -hmm. Design our whatever mechanisms we put into that to necessarily encourage mm -hmm. interdependence and codependence. We should just design us to the extent we can design them to be that way. And there's no way of, avoid, of avoiding some distributional mechanism of some sort. UBI plus, I like it if it's more conditioned on something mm -hmm. uh, that encourages more behavior. Well, that is great. And I'm convinced that Keynes was wrong, that economics is not going to end because clearly, as you're saying, we, we have a lot of work to sort out the new ways that we might be able to work in this area where where status and community and human interaction may or may not be important. I think there's a lot of un unsolved open problems. So I'm glad I, for a little while, will still have a job. So let's, uh, let's uh, uh, thank the panel and...